being middle class, I feel like you were really just in between a rock and a hard place. So there are certain kinds of assumptions around being a middle class person that have sort of shattered. And wages really in some ways are a, a reflection of the productivity and skills of American workers. Four in 10 Americans say that money uh, affects them negatively and the, and the state of their mental health. The, the consumers that have a whole lot of debt really are struggling to survive. class was once a symbol of the American dream. But the American middle class today paints quite a different picture. Being middle class, I feel like you're really just in between a rock and a hard place. You know, you're in a spot where everyone's like, hey, you're doing better than, you know, low class. You're doing great. You should be fine. Um, and you're underneath the people who are actually doing fine. It was at least a secure category. Your kids would go to a school that you felt at least OK about. You probably own a car or two and you'd own your own home and you could pay for your kids' college educations. So there were certain kinds of assumptions around being a middle class person that have sort of shattered. A survey in 2018 found that a third of middle income adults don't have $400 to cover an unexpected expense. In polls, when people are asked about being middle class, they frequently are less likely to say so. And more people now urge the pollsters to suggest that they're working class. So I think that the many people who maybe in prior years would have thought of themselves as middle class now no longer think of themselves that way. So when we think about economic status, we think about it as some static, you know, state of the world that you are either poor or not poor, you're middle class or you're not. But in fact, the reality is that many middle class families will experience one or a few years in poverty. In fact, most American families will have years where they'll be poor or near poor. That precarity, that uncertainty, that is now a feature of the middle class experience for, for most U.S. families. So what exactly happened to the American middle class? A study by the Pew Research Center discovered that the middle class, which was once comprised of the majority of Americans, has steadily shrunk since the 1970s. About 61% of American adults were considered middle class in 1971, compared to just 51% in 2019. However, the issue still remains widely debated. When people think about the state of the middle class and whether or not it's shrinking, it really is a difficult question. And I think the reason why is that as a nation, we've not actually established a formal definition of middle class. I was at a seminar recently where somebody literally said, there is no middle class anymore. The middle class is gone. And I thought, oh dear, you know, that's political rhetoric. And I understand that it's a sort of a stand-in for saying that folks in the middle are hurting, but it's just really not accurate. We looked at the size of the middle class in these 16 rich countries in 1985 and again in 2016. And one of the things that surprised me was the size of the middle class in the United States did not change. It was about 59% in 1985, and it was 59% in 2016. Experts instead prefer the term squeezed to describe what's happening to the middle class today. Even if the middle class hasn't statistically shrunk, I do think that the middle class faces more in the way of pressures to maintain or even build upon their position. What it takes to actually live a middle class life, to have quality of life, in many American cities is not what it once was. They're not necessarily able to pay their rent easily. They can't own a property. If they're in their 30s, they may not feel comfortable having kids because they will realize that having a child would be too expensive. And you know, forget about medical care. If you have one thing happens to you physically, often people don't have good enough medical care. They don't have any insurance. This all goes into making somebody part of the squeeze middle class. As the middle class lifestyle grows more expensive and uncertain, it's also moving farther beyond the reach of younger generations. In 2019, just 60% of millennials were part of middle income households in their 20s, compared with almost 70% of baby boomers. Meet Chantel Jacob. Chantel lives in suburban Texas with her husband and one child. And while a household income of just over 100000 should put her family in the middle income tier, she says that her family is still struggling toward financial stability. 
sounds great, six figures, but once we got married, the taxes that come out of my check, before I even get any money, before all of my benefits, $500 come out of my check automatically. And then you add in insurance, life insurance for my spouse, myself, and my son. And I also have money going aside for my son's college fund. It's not a lot because I can't do that much, but I want to have something for him. You know, my check that starts off at about 3000 goes down to 2200 before I even get to touch it. Our rent's about $1,700. Electricity is about 150 Phone bill is about 280 Internet 60 we both have vehicles. Those are about 800. Insurance on those vehicles is about 400. On food, four to five hundred dollars a month, but that's increasing. We budget down to the dollar, and sometimes it's very disheartening to work all week and have people tell you like, "Oh, you're so lucky. You have a great job," and then you're like, mm, "I don't know about that." There are several reasons why the middle class is feeling squeezed. The first reason is stagnated income. Between 1970 and 2018. The middle class share of aggregate income fell by 19% in the US. In comparison, the share of aggregate income for upper income households saw a rise of 19%. Another study by the Brookings Institute found that income in the middle class has grown half as fast compared to both the bottom 20% and the top 20% of income tiers once taxes and transfers were taken into account. I stay at a company for a while, my income becomes stagnant. You know, it increases by a couple thousand. Um, I generally have to job hop to have increases in my income, which in itself is not security. Middle class workers over the last 40 years have not been able to adequately benefit from the productivity growth, the expansion of the pie in the economy. We've measured this and found that the typical worker has fallen 43 percentage points behind the growth of productivity. What that means is that the middle class worker could have earned one percentage point more per year in compensation growth over the last 40 years. And they didn't get it because there was an erosion of uh, labor's share of overall income and because of rising inequality such that the top 10%, particularly the top 1%, and even more so the top 0.1%, took in much of the gains from the growth of the economy. While incomes stagnate, the cost of living has risen dramatically over the years. To put it into perspective, the average household income in the U.S. saw just a 16% increase over the last 50 years. In comparison, housing costs increased by 190% and college tuition shot up by nearly 264% in the same time period. I first moved in over here in these apartments I live in five years ago. It, my income, my rent was like $1,100. It's now $1,700. That $600 increase <laughs> happened. I did not have a $600 increase. Like my income did not increase at the same rate. Rising expenditures, rising prices, in health, housing, and education are very real, and they put a tremendous amount of pressure on income, so on households in the middle, whose income simply doesn't go as far as it used to. The situation is even worse in cities where the cost of living is already higher. An analysis in 2018 found that raising a family and a middle-class lifestyle in expensive coastal cities like San Francisco or New York needs an income of at least 300,000 a year. For reference, just 10% of all households made $200,000 or over in 2020. I recently saw an apartment next to the building I work in in Plano, and I was like, it'd be great to walk across the street to work. And it was like $2,400 for an efficiency. And I'm like, that's insane. And then it's like, for what I have, they call a townhome, three bed, two bath, $5,500. I'm like, well, absolutely not. Like, I'm going to pay $5,500 and I don't own it. It's not mine. It's just getting worse. And everyone is like, I feel like native people are being pushed out into the suburbs. And then people from out of state can come in and enjoy the beautiful fruits of Dallas and have fun and be close to the restaurants. And, you know, I have to live out here. And, you know, it's not bad, but it's not Dallas. I'm from Dallas. I grew up there. That's where I want to be. But how it is now, you know, it's just not affordable. Policymaking might be both the fault and the solution of the middle class squeeze. There is no help whatsoever. There's no policy in place to assist people. And I feel like as soon as you get a job or as soon as you're working, they're just like, oh, that's all you need is a job. You got it, you know, go forth and have at it. The stagnation of wages and paychecks for people started in the 
1970s when productivity started growing more slowly, but really accelerated after 1979 and 80 when there was a huge growth of inequality, when the top 1% took off, when the stock market grew, but people's paychecks didn't. And that has to do with issues of deregulation and excessive unemployment, the weakening of unions, the failure to raise the minimum wage, uh, globalization with uh, low wage countries that really put the kibosh on blue collar job opportunities in many places. The point is that it's not that the economy got worse, it was that there were policy decisions made so that the economic growth did not filter down to the vast majority. The country wasn't built by Wall Street bankers, CEOs, and hedge, and hedge fund managers. It was built by you. It was built by the great American middle class. In response, the Biden administration came into office in 2021 with a promise to revitalize the middle class. The $1 trillion bipartisan infrastructure bill from November 2021 and the upcoming Build Back Better Act both include provisions aimed at financially supporting middle-income families. But as Congress continues to find itself in stalemate, only time will tell whether these bills would really have an impact on the survival of middle-income households. I don't see any change effects. My friends that were struggling are still struggling. You know, I'm still budgeting down to every dollar, trying to get things done. So I just feel like if the um, changes are happening, they're not trickling down fast enough for us to see the effects of it. I think that overall, the team with the Biden administration has done quite well. At the same time, they're up against really strong headwinds. We're talking about a global pandemic that persists. We're talking about historic levels of inflation and labor shortages that are leading to these sorts of supply chain gaps worldwide. So I think that both things are true. They've done a good job, but they also have a lot of work to do. The fate of the middle class could determine the future of the American dream. I just think we do need to be concerned because this has an effect on how people perceive the American experiment working for them. And there are expectations that there should be this upward growth in mobility. But I think we do have an increasingly uh, precarious labor market for many Americans. Uh, and, and so it's important to note that this is also a feature of inequality. It's a shame that we have as much or more poverty now than we did 40 years ago, that the middle class is earning somewhat higher wages, but not in proportion to what they increased their productivity over that time. And what this does is it, it adds to division. It hurts our democracy. It, it, it hurts our uh, the upper mobility of the children of these families. That whole middle class of people is like teetering on the brink of ruin. One emergency, one catastrophe, and you can see even COVID showed you how quickly people who were doing good can just fall off and have nothing. That should have been a wake up call that we need to change some things. In June 2022, American workers made an average of $27.45 per hour. In 1972, the same workers earned an average of $3.88 per hour. A chart like this might make it seem like America has come a long way in terms of wage growth. But when adjusted for inflation, wages have remained virtually unchanged over the last 50 years, with workers today earning just 12 cents more than they did in 1972 when the average American is not seeing his or her living standards increase uh, over a period of decades, that, that's something that, that should concern us all. With inflation at its highest since 1981, Americans are feeling the pain of slow wage growth. Two thirds of American workers said that inflation has outpaced any salary gains made in the past year. Now, because of the inflation, I can't even make the monthly payments so I had to pick extra hours with my elderly care job. But some economists argue that the concept is merely a myth that politicians use to promote their careers. Politicians win elections by promising to fix something that is supposedly wrong in people's lives. And so I think there is a bit of a political cynicism and calculus involved in the wage stagnation debate and uh, promises to, to fix the supposed problem. So just how real is wage stagnation in America today? And what does it mean for American workers?
Wages in America have stagnated since the early 1970s. But it was 1979 when the gap between workers' productivity and wage began to substantially increase. Between 1979 and 2020, workers' wages grew by 17.5%, while productivity grew over three times as fast at 61.8%. It's not true that wages haven't grown at all. They have, but they haven't grown as quickly as they had in the past. Since the 80s, the economy has changed a lot. We've gone really from an industrial era to a tech era. When you have these big changes to the economy, sometimes the gains are not equally felt, but it really has an impact on everyone's lifestyle and everyone's wages. Wage stagnation is worse for lower and middle income earners. The bottom 90% of American workers saw their annual wages increase by 28.2% from 1979 to 2020, while wages for the top 1% increased by 179.3%. Meanwhile, the top 0.1% saw an astonishing growth of 389.1%. Real wages, which means that after we adjust them for inflation, has not risen that much since the late 1970s. We know that on the other hand, inequality did rise over most of this uh, period. I've been working about since the 90s when I came here. That's about 30 years on and off and there was very little rise for domestic workers in general. Now, after the 2020 with the inflation, I feel like the income stayed the same. People lost some of the jobs, like in my experience, and we have to struggle to find different or secondary job or second part-time job just to maintain the monthly expenses of our daily living. It's very hard. Despite causing severe disruption to the U.S. labor market, the COVID pandemic has led to surprising wage gains across industries. COVID has actually seen a, a significant acceleration in wage growth, particularly for, for low wage earners. This uh, reflects a really serious tightness in the labor market due to excessive U.S. demand, whether it's for the Federal Reserve or through fiscal stimulus payments, but also restrictions on labor supply, immigration restrictions, uh, early retirements and of course, illness or, or deaths. So that has driven uh, substantial wage gains. How to tell whether that's the new reality? And that's why I want to be cautious. It changed our life forever, and maybe for the better in terms of labor market and wages, we have to wait and see. Automation is one explanation for wage stagnation in America. The McKinsey Global Institute predicts that 45.3 million workers will lose their jobs due to advancements in technology by 2030. Automation has been a really big factor so far in especially manufacturing jobs. So before you build a car, you know, you use machines, but there was a lot of sort of hands-on work with it. Now much more of that is done with machines and you have to be a lot more skilled to use those machines, which means that a lot of the routine jobs have disappeared or they're very poorly paid. Over the next two or three decades, a lot of economists believe that there's going to be a lot of disruption in the labor market because of new automation. And even college educated workers, that, that financial assistance and accounting and even some parts of medical diagnoses will be done by, by machines with artificial intelligence. So, so a lot more of us might be facing that competition from these machines. Globalization is another reason for wage stagnation, forcing domestic workers to compete against unfair competition. And in a lot of countries, workers are paid a lot less. So now, particularly if you don't have a lot of very specialized skills, you're competing in that market. And that means that a lot of sort of routine office work and sort of manufacturing work is going to go overseas. But that isn't all bad news for Americans. It's important to remember that meant goods got a lot cheaper. It's one of the reasons we had such low inflation since the 80s and everyone benefited from that. But that said, I think economists like me were a little cavalier that we saw the economy growing and people doing better about the people who were hurt. And we still don't really have good solutions to help people like that. Economists suggest that labor dynamism also played a bigger role than expected. American workers today are changing jobs less frequently than before, even though job switching leads to strong take-home pay growth. While some Americans don't switch their jobs out of a desire for stability, others can't because there is nowhere else to go. 
In many local markets, companies use the lack of competition to suppress their workers' wages. The notion of monopsony power is that you have a local labor market. Let's say that you live in a particular city or in a particular town. In that town, um, there is one employer. And given that there is only one employer there, then they set the wages in a way that lower than what you would otherwise expect them to uh, pay. This was a fully competitive market. 60% of U.S. labor markets are considered highly concentrated, meaning a few employers are competing for local workers. Just 10% more workers in an area can lead to about a 1% reduction in posted wages. I've asked a couple families over the years, uh, that was still before Corona, for a $10 raise and they just declined. They said they'll find somebody cheaper and we practically lost the job. In case after case, you see that government policies were implemented to discourage labor dynamism and to discourage workers from moving to a better job or moving to a better town or city uh, to improve their job prospects. And this inevitably will weigh on wage growth over time. Companies can also play a direct role in stifling the competition with methods like non-compete agreements. Roughly half of private sector U.S. businesses that responded to the EPI survey said at least some of their employees are in non-compete agreements, meaning some 36 to 60 million private sector workers in America are subject to non-compete agreements. The non-compete clause would lead you to stay with your current uh, employer, not to move, because that you know the consequences would be that it would be more difficult for you to find employment. And if you are uh, less likely to leave the job, you'll be tied in or locked in into the current uh, employer, which means that the likelihood that that employee would keep getting his or her lower earning is much higher. The rationale for it at the very high end of the income distribution of, of the skill set, but you know I don't see much of a reason to have it for rank and file employees. Meanwhile, unions that originally fought for higher compensation have drastically lost its power over the years. Union membership in the U.S. fell from 20% of American workers in 1983 to just 10.3% in 2021. Workers in unions typically earn higher wages, about 10.2% more compared to similar non-union workers, thanks to methods such as collective bargaining. In those industries where unionization stayed somewhat high, the effect of market power or monopsony of the employer on wages was muted. So the unions were able to bargain on behalf of the employees even when they were dealing with large employers, so wages were less stagnant or didn't decline as much. But some suggest that wage stagnation is an issue blown way out of proportion. The issue we have in, a, in the wage stagnation debate is that a lot of researchers have been using a certain inflation metric, the consumer price index, that really dramatically overstates inflation over time. So if you look at two periods, you see that those expenses per CPI have gone up far more than they actually have. That means it makes it seem like your wage increase is much smaller than it really actually is. You're actually able to buy a lot more with your nominal wage than these researchers say you can. So that's why most researchers, including the Federal Reserve, like to use a different measure of inflation, the personal consumption expenditures or PCE. The PCE shows a much more moderate inflation over the last several decades. When you apply PCE to nominal wage growth, you discover much higher wage growth for middle-income workers. In other words, no wage stagnation at all, and in fact, a pretty nice gain over the last 30 years. Focusing on broad national data over individual experiences can create another issue. They see, ah, the percentage of low-wage uh, professions has increased, therefore, uh, you know, we have wage stagnation or decline. What they don't do is they don't actually look at the people in those professions and what their wages have done over time. So for example, you can have someone who is a janitor who works for 30 years and actually made substantial increases in wages and earnings over that time. That would be lost if you just look at janitors overall. I think it is technically a myth, and I think it is overblown to say that people aren't better off than they were in the 70s. It's just patently absurd. I think everything about our lifestyle and our living standards are higher, and our, even our real wages are technically higher. But 
I think there is something to the fact that wages aren't growing as fast as they used to for most people. So people don't feel like they're equally sharing the same prosperity. And I think that that is a problem that's leading to a lot of social unrest. Legislation could help solve some of the biggest issues causing wage stagnation in America. There is a limited amount that we can do through policy when you have big changes in technology, globalization, forces like that. But, but policy can matter a lot. For instance, things like those non-competes. I think that's adding to wage stagnation. And you know, you shouldn't have such a non-competes, particularly for low-skilled jobs. We could pass legislation to make it easier for workers to unionize. There was a bill called the PRO Act, Protect Our Right to Organize, that the House of Representatives has already passed. It's dead in the water in the Senate. I think we also really need to embrace more of the gig market, which so far I feel like we're trying to sort of pretend doesn't exist and make it sort of a lower tier part of the labor market. But is it if we sort of allow those platforms to offer health insurance, then I think it could become better quality jobs that are more dynamic and let people get more of the upside risk and not just the downsides. The rise of remote work could also be beneficial to wage growth in local markets. Some employers are very happy to have their employees working remotely. In a way, if you can work remotely, at least you know when you think about monopsony power, you are diminishing the monopsony power of, of an employer because that if you are a talented person, even if you are in a small town where there are, there's only one or two large employers, you can work for a global firm that can be based in any other part of the world or the US and work remotely and, and earn a higher wage. Achieving a fair wage for all Americans is vital in ensuring the success of the American economy. There's a basic, not just a basic sense of fairness. There is something historically we have called the American dream. It attracts immigrants to our shores. It, it, it motivates all kinds of people to, to innovate and make the economy productive. And wages really in some ways are, are a, a, a reflection of the productivity and skills of American workers. So if wages are stagnating for a whole bunch of people, that means that we are not becoming as productive a country uh, as we can be. That means the whole economy is not working as well as it can be. $16.15 trillion. That is how much debt American households owed by the second quarter of 2022. A staggering 41.79% increase from $11.39 trillion just 10 years prior. The, the consumers that have a whole lot of debt really are struggling to survive. They're struggling to meet rent or mortgage payments, repay college loans, to repay loans for a car. They're struggling because they've got enormous credit card debt. 60% of American adults surveyed cited their level of debt as their main reason for financial anxiety. Debt is rising every single day, and it is something that I can say is debilitating. For me, even with a master's degree and having experience out in the field for over 10 years, I've had to have at least three jobs in order to not live paycheck to paycheck. But with inflation at its 40-year high, debt in America will likely grow. 43% of Americans are expected to add even more debt within the next six months. Debt is financing asset purchases, such as a home, such as a car. And when the price of these goods goes up, then it gets reflected in the loans that get taken out. And it's that, that juggling effect, right? Do I pay off this debt or do I go get groceries or go get gas, the things that I need to actually live. So why are so many Americans in debt today? And what impact does it have on the U.S. economy? The COVID pandemic gave many Americans a chance to improve their finances. The total personal savings rate since the pandemic averaged 12.6%, compared to just 7.25% between the Great Recession and February 2020. Americans also paid off a record $83 billion in credit card debt in 2020. To help people weather this historic crisis, all sorts of supports were extended. They offered forbearance on mortgages, on student loans, other types of debt. When my specific, one set of my student 
loan payments were paused, I was able to breathe. So even with that $300 that was paused specifically in loan payments, that was enough to be able to allow for me to pay off my old car. That was enough for me to be able to save a substantial amount of money in order to put a deposit down for this beautiful place that I cohabitate every single day. So all this support led to actually a, a very historically good period in, in the terms of the serious delinquency rate on student loans, on mortgage debt, on auto debt, across all these different debt types. But concerns over household debt are rising again. Government did a whole lot of things to help households and help households in debt during COVID. Now, unfortunately, those are all gone. Interest rates are starting to rise again. Federal Reserve has already increased interest rates a good deal. They've said they're going to increase interest rates more. I will tell you how much debt I do owe. Student debt from getting my bachelor's as well as my master's degree. And then I also have debt uh, that I just started accruing in 22, purchasing a, a car that was unexpected. I have debt there, about $10,000 worth of that. And then obviously my mortgage. I owe a little under 200K on my condo. Most of the debt held by Americans is related to housing, accounting for 72.5% of the total balance. Nearly half of all Americans today say that the availability of affordable housing is a significant problem. We've seen phenomenal house price growth during the pandemic, and some of that's driven by just supply side constraints, not enough homes to go around. We also went through a decade where uh, you had to have a 700 plus credit score to qualify for a mortgage. That means that people whose credit scores were not in that strong, strong position were competing for lending dollars that were not easily available and for homes that were not easily available either. So prices just climbed and climbed. Meanwhile, student and auto loans comprise most of the non-housing debt, accounting for 35.7% and 33.7% of the total balance. College tuition for public four-year institutions rose by 179.2% between 2000 and 2020, with an average increase of 9% each year. With college education going up and up and up and up and up, it's the difference between spending a few thousand dollars, right, for your tuition and borrowing a few thousand dollars and a few tens of thousands of dollars. You get a law degree, you get a doctor's degree, you get an MBA, you get a PhD, now the debt levels are even larger. When it comes to just living and actually thriving, it's hard for me to say that it was worth it because almost every single day, the stress of money and actually being able to pay off student loan seems so out of reach. On August 24th, President Biden announced the cancellation of $10,000 in federal student loans for borrowers making under $125,000 annually. Student debt has received a lot of attention because the rate of serious delinquency, that's 90 plus days past due, has risen to the highest of the debt types tracked by Equifax. So it surpassed credit card debt in the past um, about 10 years. A close majority of people paying student loans are only paying interest. Uh, so they're not actually chipping away at that principle, and it means that the amount just builds up and builds up over time. That drives a lot of increases. For new vehicles, the monthly payment for auto loans climbed past $700 for the first time in August 2022. Median car loan term got a lot longer over the last 10 years. The idea of a five-year term is not really the standard anymore. Six-year often is, is what a lender will offer, and that means that people are paying more in interest over the life of their loan and those balances are just higher. Right now I owe under $10,000 for just my car payment and it truly does weigh on me. It feels very challenging just on the day to day of okay well I can start paying off towards my principal and pay off my car quicker or I can you know that that wrestling of the question or should I put that money into savings. While inflation pushes up the price of goods and services, most Americans feel that their wages aren't keeping up with inflation. The average real hourly earnings for all employees dropped by about 3% over the last year, while inflation increased by 8.5% during the same period. I 
wouldn't want to say that wages are not increasing at all, but given the cost of living that Americans are experiencing, it's not rising fast enough. Wages start to flatline and people go, well, I should have a better standard of living. All of a sudden it's, I can't get it out of my wages or my income, so what do I do? Well, let's put a little bit of money on a credit card or let's buy a better car and have a little bit more car debt and we'll just pay it off over a longer period of time. Even just at my age, I want to be able to embrace and do all the things that I want to do in life and it's constantly in the back of my head of, okay, should I pay off debt today or should I go embrace and enjoy the things that my beautiful city has to offer? No person should have to have that go through their head on a daily basis. It's not fair. For the American economy, household debt acts as a double-edged sword. On one hand, it boosts consumer spending, which contributes almost 70% of the total United States GDP. In order for the economy to keep growing, everything has to be bought. If stuff doesn't get bought, what's going to happen? Businesses will see their inventories pile up. They're going to cut back production. They're going to lay off workers. There's also good debt that can help build an individual's wealth over time, such as student loans, mortgages, or business loans. I think that some amount of consumer debt is a necessity in our economy. It makes sense in a lot of situations for people earlier in their life cycles to do more borrowing for things like higher education. But household debt that's out of control is correlated with a recession. Historically, rising household debt has been associated with lower GDP growth. The fact that households are going into debt in order to keep the economy going means that the ratio of their debt to their income is going up, and that makes them struggle more and more to be able to repay that debt. And if they can't repay that debt, sometime they reach a point where they've got to cut back because nobody will lend them more money. And that's when economies go into recessions. And if the debt to income level gets too great, then the problems for the economy can be enormous. Living with debt doesn't impact folks equally. We know that the lower income folks also have higher debt, debt burdens because that of that structural discrimination and historical discrimination that makes it so that um, they're not having the same access to financial products in the first place. The ratio measuring people's debt to their physical assets is heavily dependent on the race of the borrower. The ratio is 115.5% for Blacks, 65.8% for Latinos, and 98% for other races, compared to just 49.3% for Whites. The lower end of the income spectrum, the lower end of the credit score spectrum, we find that borrowers have a very hard time accessing traditional credit, like credit cards or a mortgage loan. And the credit that they do have available can be at higher interest rates and more costly. Some of it can be alternative financial services, such as a payday loan or a title loan. And these types of credit, though they serve the credit needs of these communities, to some degree, they can be quite expensive. In a lot of cases, um, the real problems are the families who are downwardly mobile, the families who were middle class, who had sort of accumulated debt based on the expectations that they would remain middle class, and then something happens in the economy. You lose your job, but you've still got your mortgage and your car payments and your college loans. Those become almost impossible to finance, and it's almost impossible for you to keep your head above water. Despite its record-breaking amount, there's no reason yet to panic about the state of household debt in America. We shouldn't be panicked about the level of household debt right now. We should keep an eye on it. We should be concerned about it. And I think it's particularly important for policy leaders and leaders in the financial world to pay attention to who and where uh, we start seeing greater challenges. Based on what I'm seeing uh, at the Federal Reserve System's reporting and more broadly than that is that there are no major warning signs of uh, disruptions like we saw during the housing crash, right, and, and the subsequent financial crisis. Policy plays a vital role in keeping household debt in check. Experts say outdated procedures such as wage garnishment, where an individual's earnings are withheld for the payment of a debt, are in dire need of a policy update. A survey found that about 7% of workers in America had their wages garnished in 2016. 
for folks who have high debt loads, they're actually getting their wages garnished or seized at really high rates. Currently at the federal level, only $217.50 is protected in, in someone's weekly paycheck. And that bill hasn't been updated since the late 60s. And so what we're proposing is to protect at least $1,000 in, in people's paycheck every week so that they have enough in their uh, weekly paycheck to support their family and pay their bills while managing their debts responsibly. Bringing back the child tax credit program could also help reduce household debt in America. Child tax credits were expanded under the American Rescue Plan of 2021 as a response to the COVID pandemic. A survey found that more than 77.8% of child tax credits were either spent or went to paying down household debt. And that had a huge impact on, on household finances. If you're behind a couple of hundred dollars every month and going into debt, and now the government is giving you a couple of hundred dollars because you have children, now you're whole again. You can pay all your bills for a couple of months, and if you can pay all your bills for a couple of months, you can maybe even reduce some of your prior debts. The government can also play a potential role in reducing certain kind of debt, such as medical debt that are owed by roughly 23 million Americans today. Medical debt is one in particular where the government, both federal government and state governments, have potential roles to play in helping households that are really at that individual level struggling with that. There's been a lag in the southeastern states of expanding Medicaid, right? And so we know that medical debt is going to be increasing, but if there's a way to expand Medicaid so that folks are better supported in terms of their medical expenses, that's going to be a way to alleviate that burden. Advocates say whether the U.S. can keep the household debt in check depends on how quickly policymakers can respond to the issue. We really need interventions to make sure to help Americans bring down that debt load and so that they can be able to res spend responsibly, save responsibly, and have those long-term goals met of perhaps buying a home or building their wealth and being able to invest. Americans seem more stressed about money than ever before. 87% of Americans said that inflation and the rising costs of uh, everyday goods is what's driving their stress. And that's one of the highest numbers of stress that we have seen in the Stress in America survey. Four in 10 Americans say that money uh, affects them negatively and the, and the state of their mental health. Money is a universal stressor, regardless of your financial standing. Poor mental health not only takes a toll on a person's overall well-being, but it's also bad for the economy. Workers experiencing even one poor mental health day a month could lead to $53 billion less in total income each year in the United States. Money touches every part of our life, right? And it's, you know, modern day survival. I felt hopeless. I was feeling that depression and I didn't really know what to do. It's affecting some Americans more than others. Statistics say that 75% of Latinos are stressed about money. One of the biggest anxieties that we face is how are we going to build generational wealth? So why is money so stressful in the United States? And what can Americans do to alleviate the pressure? With the cost of living skyrocketing, many Americans are experiencing financial stress on a daily basis. Something that comes up time and time again when we query Americans about their personal finances, essentially, it is the expenses that surprise them on an ongoing basis. So trying to pay for everyday items, not having emergency savings and debt. Those three issues are at the top of their list of concerns. Tanya Schultz and Lea Landa Verde became money coaches after they experienced their own financial struggles. So I was in debt off and on all of my 20s and early 30s. And around when I was 34 is when I had about $28,000 in debt. Even someone who has a master's degree in finance has their own personal finance issues, right? I was still figuring out how to adult as well as how to be in this corporate world, make an income, which for sure led to overspending, you know, lifestyle creep. Yeah, I was in this debt cycle of trying to get out of debt, paying off debt, getting back into it. And I was just tired of feeling like I could never get out of it or feeling like I was always going to have debt. 
More than 80% of Americans ages 18 to 43 said money is a significant source of stress for them. Certain individuals are struggling more when it comes to concerns about inflation and money. Between men and women, there were differences in the way they processed it. We had more women tell us that it was negatively affecting their mental health, yet men told us that it affects their mental health more often. I felt like I was at a low point because for my age and where I wanted to be, where I thought I should be in life, I felt like behind. I didn't have any savings. I was living paycheck to paycheck. In a lot of ways, money is a safety net or a source of stability. And without it, people feel vulnerable and anxious about the future. Latino and Black adults were more likely to say that money was a significant stressor more frequently than white and Asian respondents. Especially coming from my experience as a first gen, my parents didn't know how to navigate this financial system. That's why I even myself entered finance because I saw the stress my parents faced. So then I could learn and help protect them as well as protect the community and providing them education about finances that are you know transparent. Many Americans don't feel hopeful about their financial future, with 41% saying it's, quote, going to take a miracle to be ready for retirement. I think the problem in recent years has been that there has been this so-called risk shift, whereas the risk of being responsible for things has been shifted from others onto the individual. What can you put on that list? The cost of obtaining a college education, previously in the public realm, borne by taxpayers, we know where that's been going. The uh, burden of saving for retirement was often more heavily owned by employers when they provided pension benefits. That was shifted to individuals with the changes in 401ks. Healthcare has become increasingly expensive. That's responsible for one-fifth of the American economy, and consumers and employers bear that burden. Americans say they're feeling pressure to cut back on spending. More than 50% of adults say they've already cut back on dining out and will consider reducing their spending more if inflation continues to rise. More than 75% of adults said they're worried higher prices will force them to rethink their financial choices. Even higher income Americans making at least $100,000 per year say they either have or are considering cutting back on spending. People need to have a sense of hope. And so, you know, when the economy is working for them, there's a greater likelihood that people will have hope that they can accomplish their basic personal financial objectives. Americans are making a connection between their financial stress and worsening mental health. 42% of U.S. adults say that money negatively impacts their mental health, with 28% saying they worry about their finances daily. Many Americans tell us that some of their sources of financial stress are as simple as looking at their bank accounts or making purchases or talking about money. Thinking about money or your finances, it can feel unavoidable with the approaching summer and travel plans, holidays, gift buying, all of these things are really stressful and can trigger concerns about finances. Sometimes dealing with stress can worsen someone's financial problems. An April 2020 Credit Karma survey found that 35% of respondents said that stress from the pandemic made them impulse buy. I was sad, so I would shop. And that led to me accumulating over $30,000 of credit card debt. And I had to figure out how the heck I was going to pay that off. Things are getting way more expensive and we want to experience things and we want to live. And so in order to provide some sort of happiness, I was getting serotonin through shopping. I started drinking more and I feel like eating more and spending more. So like you start doing those coping mechanisms because you're stressed about money or stressed in life somehow. And so it was leading me down like a road that I didn't want to be on, but I didn't know. I felt stuck. I felt trapped. Mental health issues can have serious consequences for a person's overall well-being. There is clear evidence that mental illness affects your physical health. We typically see stress manifest in two ways. One are physical symptoms, so things like teeth grinding, headaches, uh, stomach discomfort, muscle tension. The second is emotional responses, so that can look like anxiety and stress, difficulty sleeping, changes in your eating patterns. And so when those come together and they are unmanaged, that's where we see really negative physical and emotional consequences. Many people struggle with the shame of their financial difficulties, and it's often a burden that's carried alone in silence. And in turn, people go to great lengths to hide their financial difficulties 
which further entrenches them in their isolation. And that isolation and burden can become so great that people facing these difficulties are more likely to experience suicidal thoughts and even make suicide attempts as a way to escape from their problems. While there are many forces at play that are outside of people's control, such as the rising cost of living, there are steps Americans can take on their own to help themselves feel more financially secure. Experts say the first step is examining your mindset around money. I was constantly looking for like, how can I find hope in this situation? Because you can have fear and scarcity, especially nowadays, it's so easy with the economy and inflation. We're bombarded by it every day. I'm like, there's not enough money. There's not enough money. So it keeps us in a scarcity mindset and that like fear around money. I faced financial anxieties myself and I had all the resources to actually take action on my debt or not even get into debt. But yet because of my mental health and because of the environment I was in and, and because I didn't want to take ownership of my finances, I had, I had to face the realness of my debt. There are experts such as therapists or money coaches who can help people deal with overwhelming feelings as well as make a financial plan. A money coach essentially is a a partner in crime that you have someone by your side that helps you hold yourself accountable and provides you financial education at the same time with guided actionable steps forward to reaching your financial goals. I think the biggest reason there's shame tied to finances because so much of our self-worth is tied to what we have in a tangible way. So people tend to relate their job or these external markers of success numbers in their bank account with their worth as a person, which is why it can be so difficult to deal with financial issues and especially seek out help for them. It's also important to monitor your physical health. What is happening to us uh, mentally, it, it affects us uh, physically also. If, if you're not treating uh, your depression and anxiety well, you are probably not doing a great job managing blood pressure and diabetes and other chronic conditions. I always kind of go back to the basics, which is to make sure you're eating healthy, that you're getting enough sleep, that you're staying active, and that you're staying socially connected. The concept in mental health recovery is that a first step is building hope. We, we need to see that there's a path to recovery and that things will get better. And they usually do.